Hello, everyone, and welcome back for the very last debate of term and the year. Um, it's been such a pleasure being your president. I'm eternally grateful to the wonderful membership who have been so engaged um, and lively and coming to the chamber in the middle of exam term. It's been wonderful. Um, I've had a great time, and I hope you have too. Um, but just before we get to the debate, where is it gone? Uh, it is tradition that we formally hand over from the Easter term to the Michaelmas one, um, one officer at a time. Firstly, uh, James Apai will be handing over to Ellie Breeze as Equalities Officer. And now our Easter Social Events Officer, Gina Holmes, will exchange with Edward Hilditch. <laughs> Next, our charming Speakers Officer, Oliver Udy, will swap with Eleanor Shimelli. Now, our lovely debates officer, Christopher George, will swap with Sam Carling. <laughs> Finally, I will be stepping down from this chair forever um, as I hand over to the most deserving, lovely, and reliable president who the society is very lucky to have, Lara Brown. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be chairing this debate, and thank you all so much for coming. But in particular, it's a real pleasure to take over from such a wonderful and impressive person. So it's one more round of applause, but I think it's really worth it. We all thank Letty for such an incredible term. Letty, thank you. <laughs> The motion before the House tonight is this House can separate the art from the artist. Um, I imagine you all know the drill, but in case you don't, we have three paper speakers on each side of the debate. They will speak for 10 minutes each. Um, after each pair of paper speakers, proposition and opposition are the moment for floor speeches. Floor speeches are your moment as the members to get involved with the debate. They make the evening, and I cannot encourage you enough to get up and speak. You have one to two minutes to convince us why we should vote in proposition, opposition, or abstention. If you don't want to make a floor speech, you can still get involved. And throughout any point in the debate, be it a paper speech or a floor speech, you can stand up and give a point of information. Simply say, on that point, or POI, or point of information. And they don't have to accept, but I really hope they will, because that's how we engage and how we sort of have really important conversations. So without any more sort of formality, because you've all waited a very long time, I'm going to introduce the first speaker, um, the wonderful Letty Ryder. Letty is the outgoing president and was once a student of architecture. She looks forward to spending a summer relighting with friends and probably with a lot of overdue work from her degree. Letty, you have the ears of the house. <laughs> Madam President, ladies and gentlemen, um, it is my great pleasure tonight to bring you a debate on something other than a dusty grey political motion. No offence to my two predecessors this year. This house can separate art from the artist. My argument lies in the belief, my belief, that art is magical. Bear with me here. When I draw something or paint something or even take a photo and it turns out well, I immediately feel a sense of disconnect from it because I couldn't do it on demand. If I create something interesting, it feels more like I was lucky enough to be graced by a muse than I myself have any sort of concrete talent. I believe in an absolute truth and an absolute beauty which art at its best taps into. I believe we can all see and understand beauty, and that art communicates far more sophisticatedly than any human could. Yes, a person makes the art, and we all attribute the art as being by that person, but it isn't simply a reflection of that person. Sometimes artists strive for this, or sometimes they try for it to not reflect them at all. But at the end of the day, it is not the artist we see when we are moved by a piece of art. It is something more, a magical, unknowable quality. 
And art from across periods and places shares this quality, from classical sculpture to cubism. There is commonality, something universal in the magic of art. The motion sets out that you can separate art from the artist. Not that you do in every situation, not that you would necessarily to improve your experience of the art, but that you can. In order to vote in proposition, all you need to believe is that you can do it. It is possible. Not that it is always beneficial to understanding a piece of art. We have to consider the term artist and who we apply it to. In Japanese classical aesthetics, art includes things like a garden, a sword, or a tea ceremony. Does an artist and a craftsman have everything in common? I think probably yes, but we'll come to that later. And we do separate the art from the artist. We all do, every day. If you can't separate the art from the artist, then what happens when you experience art whose artist you don't know? Life would be impossible if we couldn't separate art from the artist. We'd have to acknowledge every piece of art we encounter and spend countless time trying to work out who did it and whether we approve of them. I believe art is everywhere, and examples are long but range from door handles, the chairs you sit in, graphic design you see on Instagram. Art is everywhere, and artistry, craftsmanship, design exist in every sphere. And this technicality links to my greater point. Art speaks a language we can all understand, and we can all appreciate the art of the everyday without knowing the artist in every situation. Another example is to think of your favorite film. Do you know the director of photography? Do you know the film's editors? I would argue these are some of the most important artists in the film. But we are able to enjoy films and the art without knowing who they are. All art is based within a larger context and a long legacy of everything that came before it. To put so much emphasis on the artist is to give the artist too much credit. Virginia Woolf, in A Room of One's Own, writes, Books continue each other, in spite of our habit of judging them separately. Art, whether we're talking about music, film, fine art, literature or otherwise, undoubtedly comes as a result of a long history of traditions, of rules and of broken rules. And when we fail to see this, we dismiss our history. This is a dangerous game to play. Should we dismiss a body of artwork because we discover the artist was a reprehensible human being? Should we discard all the work that came after it and that was inspired by it? We should be skeptical when doing this. To take a different tack, wouldn't you say it was wrong to walk around a gallery and think nothing much of a painting, only to become a fawning admirer and being told by your mum that it's a Rubens? Surely it is not the Rubens which makes the paintings fantastic, but the fantastic paintings which make Rubens known as who he is. The art should make the artist known, not the other way around. Kant describes genius of art as this perplexing, unknowable quality which causes art to be great or beautiful. We find genius in sculpted stone, stone, in basilica ceilings, in paint. But I think Kant credits genius to the artist too much. And when we do this, genius is sometimes used as an excuse for great artists to get away with terrible things. And that is exactly my point. When we accept that genius that we see in the art, the magic is a commonality of all great art, and that is not something which you can accredit to one person, then we can truly punish the artists who are bad people. We want to cancel an artist and their body of work when we found out a horrific thing they've done because we seek to implement justice and often feel we live in a society where powerful people don't feel the pinch when they do terrible things. But to separate artists from the art is the truest punishment. If we acknowledge that the minute someone creates a piece of art, they are immediately separate to it, by nature and by theory, then they can be condemned in the best way, in which we enjoy and appreciate that art itself, but not for them. The truth is, of course, that famous pieces of art often have famous artists behind them. But to assume that it is an individual, a personality, which is solely to thank for them is absurd, especially if we consider the conditions and backgrounds of many of the greats. It's no coincidence many of the greats come from similar social groups, and that before the 20th century, women artists are few and far between. Great art often required a few things, patronage, supportive families, academic training, of which not everyone would have access to, especially not women. A lot of great art is born from craftsmanship, of technical ability. Like a scientist, it is measured and exact. I th if we think of art as mere mortals striving to tap into an absolute beauty and truth, then we can see craftsmanship as a technique to get into that. Francis Bacon rejected that his work was inspired by his difficult life. He would say his paintings were about painting. He was obsessed with other painters. He acknowledges the arts, the craftsmanship, 
not the artist's, not the artist's personal context. It's not someone's personality or their background which makes art beautiful, but rather how effectively it translates and articulates human experience into something cognizable. For example, Tchaikovsky's Pathetic Symphony is even more poignant when you listen to it with the knowledge that he is tortured by hiding his sexuality. But it is not this experience alone that makes the music beautiful. It's the efficiency, the agency, the genius in which he translates this experience into something which communicates with all. What is truly unique and truly valuable about art is that it transcends people's backgrounds. And once born, it is a language which we can all understand. If we can't separate art from the artist, then our society splits into those who say, like Picasso, for his work alone, and those who don't because of who he is. If we can separate art from the artist, we can find common ground, shared admiration or appreciation for the significance and beauty of his work, which goes far beyond the individual artist. Surely, in many ways, that is something similar to what we all value about this place that we can all gather as equals and judge what people say here based on the truth of their statements. Instead of valuing those statements because they were made by an individual from a certain place or holding a certain office, what we value here is truth, and that is separable from any individual speaker. What we value about art is truth and beauty, and these things are likewise separable from the artist. So, if you believe that we communicate in a language through art, which is above personal circumstance and experience, if you believe that art is a moving body of work and ideas where every artwork is the result of all those before it. And most of all, if you believe that art is magic, please vote in proposition tonight. Thank you. Thank you again, Letty, for a wonderful set of remarks, and thank you for guiding the society so well the past term. We're all truly grateful. Um, second to speak for the opposition, I'd like to welcome Jasper Federman. Jasper is a second-year undergraduate student of theology at Pembroke and the union's head guest liaison. He won the right to speak through open audition. Jasper, the floor is yours. Thank you. Madam President, I would like to start my speech tonight by congratulating Letty on her fantastic speech and an excellent term as president. While I hope that this flattery should help me secure my role for the next term in the union, in all sincerity, I'm very grateful for everything Letty has given to this society and for her friendship. Now let me tell you why she's fundamentally wrong. <laughs> this, issue, <laughs> this issue first caught my attention in 2012 when Dan Cathy, the owner of Chick-fil-A, the US fast food giant, spoke out against gay marriage. And while I was grateful that I finally had this Chick-fil-A owner's opinion on the gay marriage debate, it forced me to reckon with the fact that some of the things I love come with baggage. And, that, and I think that it's this fact that this debate centers on tonight. Can we separate the things we like from the people that make them? And more poignantly, do we think that's important and should we? It's not, just that there, it's not just that so many people that we love and that have made great art are morally problematic. It's that they're the people we love. It's that they're the people whose art and accomplishments helped us form our identities, bond with our parents, and define our childhoods. It's hard enough to stop eating a chicken sandwich when it's delicious, but a homophobic man makes a rant. So what are we meant to do when our favorite singer or actor has done something awful? Are we supposed to stop supporting them entirely and giving them our money? We are emotionally interwoven with the art that shaped our identity. So just saying that we should detach ourselves is, is painful and unhelpful. Or to extend my earlier example, it's not just that the chicken sandwich is delicious, it's that our best friend made it. And I'll consider this approach going forward in two ways. Firstly, I'll consider the bad things that we love that, we, that can change, that have the ability to change. Take, for example, the Washington-based American football team with a name that was formerly uh, the, sorry, the name was formerly a uh, slur for Native Americans. Their owner, Dan Snyder, um, claimed, and he put this in all caps lock in the quote that I read, that he would never change the team's name. And despite the fact that he went against that and the team's name has now changed, it's no longer as racist, um, we don't need to be a Washington-based American football fan to relate to this problem. Chances are we all have something that would just be a little easier to love if it would change a little, just get with the times and adapt. And in these times, we might turn to some ethical theories to think, should we keep supporting them, or should we cut our emotional and our financial times, our ties? Sorry. Let's start by seeing if Kant can help us solve this issue of the racist American football team name. Kant, famous lover of rules, might give us a nice rule you can use. 
Um, Kant would probably argue that the co-opting of Native American imagery for their mascot is a use of uh, other people as a means to an end. And as such, probably Kant would not support the team. But how about utilitarianism? While it might seem to support Snyder, because the changing of the team's name uh, might potentially upset more people uh, as the fans of the teams than the indigenous people uh, if he chose to retain it. But however, these pains are not comparable. It's not simply about the amount of pain, sorry, the amount of people feeling the pain, but the intensity and the duration of that pain. Teams change their name all the time, uh, and when they don't, it's often ridiculous. My favorite example when I was Googling this, I didn't know a lot about American football beforehand, was the LA Lakers. Um, I thought, that's a bizarre name. Formerly the Minneapolis Lakers, a place with loads of lakes. LA, famous for having no lakes. So their name seems slightly incongruous now. But, yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, can be I'm more trying to argue the point that it's the things we love that can change and, the thing, and it's our passion behind these things and whether they do change or not that is the crux of the issue here. I'm not trying to argue what, or what is not art. We have aesthetics professors for, to do that tonight for us. I'm trying to argue about how your personal beliefs should square up against facts of moral right and wrong. And with that, I'll continue. I'm going to continue if that's all right. Thank you. Um, it's not... Sorry, so teams change their name all the time. And given how frequently these changes, the consequentialist argument falls apart. Having attended many a union debate in, this, in my time, I know that this is probably the point that some, uh, some peppy proposition supporting HSPS fresher who took the bus in from Girton will probably pipe up and say, but how much harm is created if I support the team in private? And to be fair, it depends on how the fandom manifests. If our Washington American football fan is spending, is, um, is spending money on tickets? Is she tweeting in, in public support? Is she wearing the kit out and about uh, spreading the racist logo? I, con I concede that purely private fandom likely does not create too much consequentialist harm. But I think it's here that the crux of the issue lies. Whether and where the other side are going to let you down. We may only create a little bit of harm by sitting at home and watching our favorite team play, but we're the ones who have to live with our choices. We are, as Bernard William puts it, specially responsible for what we do rather than what other people do. We may use these ethical theories and use the Benthamite hedonic calculator to decide that quietly rooting for the team is okay. And I'm not here to criticize that. That's fine, but you've got to do a gut check with yourself and ask whether that's okay. And you know what? After that gut check, you might still decide that's okay. And you might holistically consider what matters to you is you cannot consider your life without American Washington football teams. And that's fine. And before I explain to you why that's fine, I'll turn to the second side of the debate, which is the things that we root for and the art that we love, uh, as, as pointed out, uh, that can't change. It's rather than the easy fix of changing a team name, some issues are unchanging, be it Michael Jackson's music, Thomas Jefferson's writing, or Roman Polanski's movies, where the anguish-causing thing is unchangeable. It's set in stone. I mean, even writing the speech, I had to read the the works of Aristotle, who believed that uh, only people capable of, the only people capable of virtue were free males and, to put, and put so much effort on explaining why slavery was fine. This, for me, is where it becomes more difficult. I remember growing up, my dad and I would watch Good Will Hunting religiously. I can definitively say that my relationship with my father would be different without that film. So you can imagine the issue I had when Harvey Weinstein, the film's financier and producer, was arrested and convicted of being a serial sex offender. Unlike the Washington American football team or Chick-fil-A, there's no easy fix for this. Chick-fil-A can change their stance on LGBTQ plus issues. Cambridge colleges can take down statues of slave traders, like Jesus, sorry. Um, but my bond with my father is rooted in amongst a man whose actions are not only abhorrent, but a fact of history. I can hear that annoying fresher already. She's saying, but Jasper, I bet you own Good Will Hunting on DVD. And of course I do. Um, so watching it doesn't support what I've seen at all. But here is where the proposition will fail you. Their view denies us our individual integrity. The fact that although I have it on DVD, I still feel icky whenever Harvey Weinstein Miramax logo shows up on the screen. It's the things that make us us that are at risk when you when you side with the proposition. It is here that both the love of the thing and the anguish that loving that thing causes must be acknowledged. It isn't by separating the art from the artist that I'm able to watch the film because that simply ignores the questions in my mind and the internal conflicts that are caused. We may feel icky about watching the movie and that is completely separate from the good or bad caused to other people. 
And there are, of course, levels to this. While Kant would not have you enjoy any fruit from a poisonous tree, explaining that you shouldn't enjoy art from an artist who has committed like an unforgivable sin, how far does this extend? What counts as an unforgivable sin? Should I not enjoy Kanye because he holds political belief that I abhor, namely that he thinks that he should be president? Um, that's not what's at issue here. If we fail to care about the moral shortcomings of artists, we teach them that they, do whatever they, they can do whatever they want and that we'll continue to give them our money and our attention. But if we care too much, and the human tendency for having, with the human tendency for having moral shortcomings, we might never enjoy art again. That's, like I said, there are levels to this. When I watch Good Will Hunting with my dad on DVD, Miramax is not getting any more money. So that's better than going to the cinema, presumably. But I still have to internally reckon with the fact that I'm enjoying art made by somebody who I find morally reprehensible. The most important part of dealing with this art versus artist debate is not simply pretending that the artist doesn't exist when engaging with their material, but it's the fact that we care and we are trying to do the right thing. If I love... Yeah. But surely what Harvey Weinstein did outside of his directing job does not have anything to do with what he did on the set, how he did the set. But it's a fantastic point. Harvey Weinstein never did anything wrong when he was a director, guys. That was all unrelated. <laughs> no, sadly, I think that, unfortunately, artists and their art do have some connection. I'll concede with the proposition. There is some link between the two, but I'm trying to say that you can't separate the two. I think that Harvey Weinstein's directing is related to what he was doing, and I don't think that... Thank you. I don't think that you can separate those entirely. And I was going to say... If we love a problematic person or thing too much to part with it entirely, I think that we must remember two things at the same time. Firstly, I love this thing. And secondly, the person who made that thing is troubling. Forgetting about the former forces us to lose a part of ourselves, which I'm not proposing we do. But forgetting about the latter means that we're denying, uh, we're denying that this thing causes us and other people harm. And therefore, we're failing to show concern for the victims of awful behavior. Sometimes we'll, we'll find it impossible to enjoy a piece of art in light of its artist. They'll do something that we simply cannot support, and the idea of spending our time or money or attention with their material goes out of the window, even in a private setting. But at other times, when something is so inextricably, inextricably woven into our core identities, life without it seems unthinkable. Maintaining those two ideas simultaneously can help us avoid the pain of severing all ties while still striving for self-improvement and becoming a better person. This is undoubtedly the point where my fresher friend would pipe up for the final time and ask, but where do you draw the line? And the answer is somewhere. We may draw it in different places, but you need to draw it. Each of us, for ourselves. Don't let the proposition tell you how to interact with art. Find it for yourself. Decide for yourself. For me personally, I draw it somewhere between I'll still wear Hugo Boss despite their Nazi tendencies, but I won't <laughs> listen to R. Kelly despite the Aggression remix being a bit of a banger. Now. Now that I've publicized and drawn my line somewhere in this line, in somewhere in this area, of course I'll find myself having contradictions. And my friends like Leslie will jump up and be gleeful in pointing out my hypocrisy when I do when I do fail to meet my own standards. But that doesn't mean my argument is wrong. It doesn't mean that we should all give up and just pretend we're happy watching Kevin Spacey and Baby Driver because his art and him are different. It just means I should go back, mull it over, redraw the line perhaps. Contradictions within our own system of integrity are opportunities to try again. By drawing these lines, we're accepting that one day we'll have got it wrong and we'll, and we'll backfire and we'll go back, but that isn't a bad thing. By siding with the opposition tonight, you're supporting your own individual autonomous right to choose, to create your own relationship with the art you enjoy, rather than having that relationship decided by a now ex-union president. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jasper, for that excellent set of remarks. Um, I'm now going to move to a round of floor speeches. Um, this is your chance to influence the direction of the debate and how we should vote, so they're really exciting. Um, you can speak in proposition, opposition, or abstention, as I said before, and you have one to two minutes. Um, first, for the proposition. Letty here brought up the excellent example of Tchaikovsky. So Tchaikovsky is currently cancelled by many of the great orchestras of Europe because Russia invaded Ukraine, and poor Tchaikovsky happens to be Russian, and obviously we have no idea how he felt about it, but he probably would disapprove. And similarly, 
uh, we can think of Einstein. Einstein and a whole host of Jewish physicists were canceled by the Nazis simply because of who they were. Okay, I'm stretching the definition of what art is. But my, my point here is that if we allow society to decide what should be viewed or not viewed or just thought about or not thought about simply because of who originated it, I think that this is foolish at best and dangerous at worst. And moving across to the opposition. It's Igor from Pembroke. Um, I think what makes our species special is our creativity. So just to define what I think art is, I think art is something that is creative. Um, but going into our digital age, uh, we're pretty much able to reproduce any selection of pixels or perhaps render any selection of pixels would be more appropriate, we choose. And these days it's almost hard to differentiate between pixels that have been rendered by a computer and those that have been produced by an artist. And so I would argue that the only thing that makes us special as a, as a civilization is that connection between art and artist. And as soon as we start to break that down, then we have this, this huge mass of art that could exist that wouldn't have an attached artist. And an example that I was thinking of this would be all these big tech companies making huge digital, digital worlds. I wouldn't argue those digital worlds that they're creating are an example of art. But there are many artists out there that are creating digital NFTs or whatever you call them, and they sell them, and they, and they, and they sell them for lots of money, and they're classified as art. So what's the difference between the, the digital, digital world being created and these bits of artwork? I think it's the artist, and I think to break down those, that connection would be dangerous. Thank you. And finally, we're looking for speech and abs um, abstention. I'm going to do my uh, classic trademark move of abstaining. Um, hi, my name is Sal, and I'm sorry if my hair's not on point because I've been swimming in Grantchester, uh, enjoying the weather. Um, so I'm going to paint a little picture for you with words and um, tell you a little story about, about something quite personal. So Sal is short for Salvador, and I'm named after Dali, the artist. Um, oh. And, you know, it's always been quite nice to introduce myself to people, you know, what's your name, hi, etc. And I say, Salvador, like Dali. And everyone says, oh, wow, I really like his paintings. But, and that happened throughout my entire life until one day, um, my friend introduced me to their dad. And I said, hi, I'm Salvador, nice to meet you. Um, and instead of having a nice reaction to it, a deep growl started rumbling in his throat. And he, and he fixed me dead in the eye, and he said, Oh, you're not a bloody fascist like him, are you? And I was really shocked. I didn't know this. And so it turns out the story of Salvador Dali is he started off as a radical um, communist in, in Spain uh, with the Surrealist art group, and the Spanish Civil War was raging between communists and fascists. Um, and he was very much on that left-wing side, and this was during the period of time where he produced the most innovative and um, interesting art that really pushed the boundaries of, of contemporary art at that time. Uh, but fast forward a few, few years later, and for what I don't know what the reason why he changed, but he, uh, when Franco won and the fascist regime won in Spain, probably was a uh, political convenience that he did it, but he started becoming a raging Nazi and fascist and apologizing for Hitler. Uh, but interestingly, at the same time, his art got a lot more blander um, and he, he lost a lot of critical acclaim. So I would firstly say that there's a link between the art and the artist quite clear there. But I would also say that, um, you know, from my personal experience, people do separate the art from the artist because people don't... The first thing I think is good paintings like Sleep uh, by Dali or just the, the idea of sur the surrealist movement. They don't think um, of, of what he said. Um, but why am I abstaining then? I'm abstaining because I just personally don't really care if we can or can't. I'm, I'm just happy we do, because it makes introducing myself a lot nicer. Thank you.
and now we will actually move to Professor Terry Eagleton. Terry has been called Britain's most influential academic critic and has written extensively on literary theory, aesthetics, and postmodernism with a particularly Marxist take. He is currently Professor of English Literature at Lancaster. Terry, the floor is yours. Madam President, ladies and gentlemen, I used to be a student here in the early days of the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> um, I was sitting one day in my tutor's room talking about Jane Austen, or as he called her, Miss Austen. He didn't actually go as far as to talk about Mr. Chaucer, as far as I remember, which I thought was rather discourteous of him not to. But it began to grow rather cold, and he had a heater at his feet. So he said to me, let's put the heater on, should we, in a tone of rather suppressed excitement, as though we were both about, about to embark on some enthralling adventure together. You know, he didn't get out very much. Yeah. But instead of just bending down and flicking the switch, putting the heater on, he got up and he crossed the room and he went to his desk and he rummaged among the papers and he found his telephone and he lifted the receiver and he called a member of the college staff to come and put his heater on. And indeed, in a few minutes, it almost magically quickly, a man in a white jacket appeared in the door. And my tutor asked him with great courtesy, he was, he was not in the least of an arrogant person, to put his heater on, which he did. It's just that he, my tutor would no more have thought of putting on his own heater than he would of extracting his own appendix. You know. This wasn't the kind of thing you did. I'm sure things have changed by now. I'm sure you now all have a little man in a white jacket to put your heater on, you know, it's known as democracy. Um, today, of course, is Bloom's Day. If there are any poor, godforsaken Egypts here who don't know what Bloom's Day is, just approach me privately after the debate, and for a very modest fee, I'll let you know. Um, it's a great day of celebration in where I come from in Ireland. I'm Irish by origin. Um, although, of course, we're all Irish in the eyes of God. Um, <laughs> God put the Irish on the earth for everybody else to feel romantic about. <laughs> but we don't feel in the least romantic about ourselves, not least because of our wretched history. Ireland was the first, is the oldest British colony, and part of Ireland is still semi-colonized. Um, Joyce himself, James Joyce himself, had an interesting view of the relation between art and the artist. Namely, he thought there wasn't any. Um, Joyce's aesthetic, like much modernist aesthetics, is ruthlessly impersonal. Joyce has no time for the soppy romantic myth of individual subjectivity, as indeed most modernists don't. Joyce thought that the artist disappeared, he said, behind and beyond his or her artifact, detached, dispassionate, and, he said, paring his fingernails in aloofness from the art itself. And D.H. Lawrence thought much the same. In a famous quotation, Lawrence says, don't trust the teller, Trust the tale. Yes. The tale has its logic and dynamic and inner form and meanings of which the teller may know little or nothing. Um, the French poet and critic Jean Paul Valéry said uh, there are many things involved in the making of a work of art other than the author. Many things involved. The Victorian poet Robert Browning was once asked by a woman what one of his notoriously obscure poems meant. And he said, Madam, when I wrote that poem, God and Robert Browning knew what it meant. Now, God knows. <laughs> T.S. Eliot, once uh, about whom I write in a recent extremely cheap and very attractive book called Critical <laughs> Revolutionaries, on sale at every decent bookshop in the land, T.S. Eliot once remarked that the wasteland was really, he said, a kind of rhythmical grousing. Well, sorry, Tom, old boy, but you're wrong. 
may sound a lot more than a lot of rhythmical rhythm. There's no reason why an artist should have privileged access to his or her own meanings or be in control of all his or her own meanings. Um, it's surely one of the central insights of late modernity uh, that we are profoundly opaque to ourselves, profoundly opaque to ourselves, and that includes artists as well as everybody else, as opposed to a high enlightenment rationalism for which essentially we are transparent to ourselves in a Cartesian kind of way. We have a direct access to ourselves that we don't have to anybody else. In a sense, you might say modern philosophy has stood that, post-Wittgensteinian philosophy has stood that on its head. Of course, other people can know us or know our poems or our paintings or our compositions better than we know ourselves. Why not? Um, I, um, something I once wrote in a, in, a, in a typically audacious and pioneering and original and illuminating way, you can find in all of my work, really, if you care to look at it. Uh, I wrote about, I wrote about uh, the, Macbeth, Macbeth, the witches and Macbeth, and I said, I argued that the witches are the heroines of Macbeth, yes? And actually, I think a plausible case can be made out, that the, you know, flippancy aside, that the witches are the heroines of Macbeth. Um, would Shakespeare have thought that? No, surely not. Surely not. Does it matter? No, I don't think so. You, let's put it this way. I think you could say uh, a work of art means whatever it can plausibly be made to mean. A lot, of course, hinges on that little word, plausibly. But plausibly be made to mean. Our authors may be illuminating about their own work, or they may be desperately dim-witted about it. Many authors are even more dim-witted than critics, would you believe it, when it comes to their own work. However, what kind of author are we talking about? The word author needs surely to be unpacked here because, in my view, there is only one fundamental author, source, originator of art and culture and civilization, and that is labor. That is labor, which is not popular to talk about these days. Yeah? Labor is the source of civilization and art. Um, and labor, which has been historically carried on for the most part in pretty dreary and exploitative conditions, which is why the great German philosopher, Walter Benjamin, said famously that there is, not, there is no document of civilization that is not at the same time a record of barbarism. There is no document of civilization it is not at the same time a record of barbarism. He's not say, he saying it's not civilization, it's barbarism. He's saying both together. Whereas a certain conventional way of thinking imagines that there once was barbarism in the dark days and then slowly civilization begins to dawn, uh, Benjamin's uh, and many other thinkers' idea is the opposite. Civilization and barbarism are synchronic rather than sequential sides of the same coin, and the materialist critique of a symphony or a novel or a painting is one which tries in, in grasping the elements of civility, as it were, at the same time, x-rays this work to see, to find the hidden traces of barbarism from which it, in part, arises. For every um, cathedral, a pit of bones. Does that mean we shouldn't be cathedrals? No, of course not. But we have to develop a way of thinking, it used to be called dialectics in the days when men wore sideburns and denim suits, and I was a student here, a, a dialectical way of thinking which can grasp both of those things together. Yeah? It's quite difficult. Um, for every grand philosophical idea, um, uh, an, an anonymous army of obscure laborers. Speaking of obscure, Thomas Hardy um, um, cites his last novel, Jude the Obscure, in Oxford. If you don't, anybody here who doesn't know, had never heard of Oxford, perhaps, maybe some of you. <laughs> Oxford is a place to the northwest of London uh, where they can't spell maudlin. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
and I assure you that's the only bit of this speech you'll remember. <laughs> okay. um, and Hardy sets the novel, as you may know, in that part of Oxford, still known today as Jericho, a little community of artisans who spend their time repairing and maintaining the high minds of the university, and who, as Hardy says, without whom the hard readers would not read and the high thinkers would not think. Um, and of course, also, you might say, I'll just conclude on this, sir, as, as the gentleman hands me, or now takes his hand off the final notice, um, in, uh, behind most great men, great men, uh, a woman who does the donkey work, who does the drudgery, um, the small son of a Cambridge Don, a male, a male Cambridge Don, was showing a visitor around his father's study, and he put, there was a shelf uh, consisting entirely of his father's works, and the son pointed proudly to the shelf and said to the visitor, see that shelf? My mummy typed all that. <laughs> and just to show you, finally, that underneath uh, high and sublime things, there can be li there lies mundane and prosaic ones, uh, well, behind my dazzlingly perceptive discourse to you this evening lies a speech which is written on the cut-up pieces of a oat cake box from <laughs> Tesco. <laughs> Thank you so much for such a wonderful speech. Um, I'll now move back across the opposition and welcome Dr. Daisy Dixon. Daisy is a philosopher of art and artist and current research fellow at Peterhouse. She explores how visual art behaves like speech and how curators and interpreters can affect what an artwork says and does. Her current project concerns how some art can function as hate speech and how protest art can form counter speech, which disarms the harms of dangerous art. Daisy, you have the ears of the house. Madam President, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me. Um, just a brief content warning, I'll briefly be talking at the end of the speech about artists who have committed child sex offences. Um, so yes, as the introduction said, I'm a philosopher, so I'm going to take you through a couple of thought experiments, and because it's a philosophical argument as to why uh, we cannot separate the art from the artist, uh, therefore I hope you'll see that it's true. So... A few decades ago, the artist Alan Jones exhibited his infamous installation, Hat Stand, Table and Chair. And if you remember it, it shows women dressed in fetish clothing posed as pieces of furniture. Hat stand, ta I won't demonstrate, but <laughs> table, uh, she's on her hands and knees with a pane of glass across her back. And chair, she's got her legs up in the air. And there was a lot of backlash against this artwork. Uh, many protesters um, were very angry about it, and one person even threw a paint stripper over the chair sculpture. Why were they so angry? Well, they interpreted the artwork to be very sexist. They took it to be objectifying women. Now, the artist actually didn't intend his artwork to have this effect at all. He had some different agenda for it. He was making a comment on his distaste for minimalism at the time. Interesting intention. Um, but nonetheless, people interpreted it as being sexist. Now, this is where the thought experiment begins. Imagine in a different world, much like our own, those very same sculptural forms are composed, but this time it's been made by a woman in the year 2020, say, in the wake of the Me Too movement. Very same sculptural forms, but this time made by women. It seems right to say that we'd have a very different artwork here, one itself that didn't objectify women, but one that instead protested against sexism and exposed how women are still treated in society today. So we describe different meanings to these two different artworks, even though they look exactly the same. We'd also perhaps ascribe different values to them. Maybe we prefer the latter. Maybe we think it's more... Maybe we didn't like the first one, we thought it was distasteful. Maybe we prefer the other one because it's making an interesting political message or something. So what this thought experiment shows is that it matters who made the artwork. Its origin, its context, is integral to how we actually understand these interesting forms in front of us in the installation. 
And this sentiment is reflected also in Arthur Danto's famous red square thought experiment. And he asks us to imagine walking into a museum and you see a row of identical red square canvases. They're all painted red, they look exactly the same. But the first one is called the Israelites crossing the Red Sea. The second one is just called Red Square, a minimalist work. The other one is called Kierkegaard's Mood. And the other one is called Red Tablecloth, made by a cynical disciple or follower of Matisse. And the other one is just an unfinished canvas by Giorgione. It's a primed canvas. He never turned it into a, into a painting. Now, all of these, paint, all these objects look exactly the same, but some are art and some are not art. And amongst the ones that are art, we interpret them differently again. We ascribe to them different aesthetic properties. The first one we see is depicting something. It's showing the sea. The other one we see is having a kind of minimalist meaning. It's just a red square. The other one we might see as having emotional content. Why would a mood be painted as red? What might that mean? The other one is a comment on Matisse's style. And as I've said, the last one isn't even a work of art at all. So what these two thought experiments show us is that there's more to an artwork than its perceptual features. There's more to a painting than its shapes and forms on a canvas. There's more to a poem than its text. There's more to an installation than just sculptures arranged in a space. An artwork's context, its origin, who made it, when, and why they made it, is integral to its identity. It's integral to the very thing that is an artwork. I'm not going to try and define what an artwork is today, but what I'm going to try and persuade you is that artworks are these particular thick objects. They're rich. They're not just surface features. They have these contexts and histories behind them. And if we engage with just the work's perceptual forms, you can do what you like with a poem's text. You could do what you like with a painting's uh, perhaps magical or beautiful properties. You could interpret that, and it could have all sorts of interesting meanings for you. But if you don't engage with the artwork's history, you're not treating it as an art work of art at all. You're treating it as something else entirely, and that's fine. But in this sense, you can't separate the art from the artist, because the artwork is this particular kind of object. So artworks don't just drop out of the sky. They're made by people situated in certain time and place. And you might also think that artworks are communicative objects. We do very often ascribe them meaning. They're normally about something, even if it's a simple landscape, or a red square, or a complex religious painting. And even if that meaning that we ascribe to it, or variety of meanings, artworks often have a whole host of meanings, even if they diverge from what the artist actually intended, and I won't go into artist intention here, I'll defer to my esteemed colleague, Professor Matravers, later for that, no pressure. Um, but even if the artist's intention, even if the meaning we ascribe to the work diverges from what the artist actually intended, as viewers, when we engage and approach an artwork, we should still consider the work in what I've called this thicker sense, this involved sense, treating the artwork with this history coming from a particular person, a flesh and blood person occupying a certain social position. Gender, class, race. Was this painting made by a, a working class woman, for example? That matters. Now, that might not have complete authority over what the work means, but it is still part of where the artwork came from. It's still part of its identity. We can sometimes separate meaning from identity in this sense. And just in the remaining few minutes, I want to address the problem of immoral artists head on. So if you think of artworks as being a bit like language, I think they behave similar to speech often. We might think, well, the problem with a moral artist is, in many cases, we might not... The problem is that we're not seeing evidence of the artist's immorality in the artwork itself. So I'm going to go through a few cases to try and show you where, even in cases where there's no direct evidence of their immorality, we still can't separate them. So the first is an easier case where there's actual evidence of the artist's immoral character in the artwork. We know that Picasso was a misogynist, so we might find traces of that misogyny in his paintings of women, some of which are literally turning them into objects, like chairs, and in other paintings, he literally turns their heads into penises. If you know he's a misogynist, you might read that in. That seems kind of relevant. I'm not saying they're not bad, they're bad paintings. I think Picasso is a brilliant painter, but it still has this content. Or, even if there's not a direct trace of the artist's immorality in the painting, we might look to the motivations of the artist. 
and how an art artist's immoral motivation can have direct relevance to the content of the artwork. So to move away from art briefly, the moral qualities of my actions are often determined by the motivation behind them. So if you find out that your friend is helping at a homeless shelter purely for their genuine care for the homeless community, that seems like a good thing to do. But if you found out that, that their motivation was something different, say they were doing it to impress a love interest, that seems to take away some of the moral value of their action. So the motivations that they have determine the moral qualities of their action. The same is the case for artworks. If you found out that a painting of a young girl was made by a paedophile, and even let's just assume in the painting the young girl isn't sexualized in any way, there's no visual trace or evidence of sexualization in the painting, but if you found out that the artist made it for their own sexual gratification, their motivation was an immoral one, it seems that that would have an effect on the quality of the artwork. You'd certainly read it differently, and you'd be right to do so because the identity and content of the work has that immoral origin. And even in the case where the artwork has no trace of the artist's immorality, and let's just assume the artist had a completely morally neutral motivation when making their work. So let's take Rolf Harris's, thank you, Rolf Harris's landscape paintings. Yeah, child sex offender. Let's just take these landscapes, nothing to do with children. Okay, let's just assume he made them, and he did make them with morally neutral motivations. He was just experimenting with the paint. Well, even there, it's still an object created by a paedophile. It's still an object created by those hands, and you wouldn't want that object in the house, even if the artwork's meaning, its depiction has no relevance to the artist's misdeeds. Much like I might not want a chair made by Hitler in my home, it's the same thing. This object came from that person. So to conclude, artworks do not grow out of the ground like mushrooms. They are distinctively human creations. They're products of what Kant said, products of rational doings. They're achievements by people. They're the products of problem solving, working with, within medium and artistic movements. Why do we value originals over forgeries? Because originals represent a particular kind of human achievement and the forgery is just a copy. We think that represents a different human achievement, already bringing in the artist there. So the very nature of a work, its identity, was always already tied to the person who created it. You can't separate the art from the artist because the artist is a necessary part of the art. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daisy, for such a fine speech. And we'll now move back to a round of floor speeches. I think I saw a hand at the back. Um, so, yes, in proposition, Ollie. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start this by saying I feel fairly out of my depth to talk about art in the abstract, as our speakers have done so well. Um, I just maybe talk about my personal experience, and that is that you can separate the art from the artist, but the, the intertwining of the two is somewhat momentary a lot of the time. So, my personal experience, you know, you're watching a brilliant movie, you see at the start it goes, uh, Weinstein Brothers at the start, and it makes you think about the connotations of the work. The same with maybe, uh, as Jasper was saying, with the Washington uh, football team, you know, you think, okay, what are the connotations of this? Um, same with you in a gallery, maybe look at the work and then look at who did it, and then you think about it after. But at the point of which you consume the art, it seems as if the ability to separate the art and the artist is far easier. Um, you don't kind of, maybe this is me speaking from my kind of like privileged, privileged position, but I don't think uh, when I watch Harvey Weinstein movie, throughout every single emotion I'm feeling is through the lens of um, kind of like a misogynistic uh, work culture, for instance. Um, so I think while perhaps there are points at which you, you can't separate the art from the artist, especially when you're confronted with directly, throughout the, your whole experience of the art, especially when you first see it, you can separate the two. Um, fundamentally, because art is, your, your reaction to art is quite an, a natural phenomenon, and it's perhaps not only channeled through your idea of that artist. Uh, 
Um, and moving now over to your position, uh, again, at the back. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, Keir Bradwell, Queen's College. Um, if this motion was this house would separate the union president from the union society, I would be a vehement proponent of the motion. But it isn't that. It is this house would separate the art from the artist. And I think what's been interesting is that on the proposition and the opposition tonight, um, we've heard little glimmerings of political theory throughout. We've heard Letty suggest Immanuel Kant as our guide to art um, and the artist. And we've heard Jasper suggest Bernard Williams. Now, for those of us who have done poll one at the very least, um, this may seem obvious. We may as well in the debate now. So Bernard, who is right about everything, and Emmanuel, who is wrong about everything, why bother debating anymore? But I think it is worth, at the very least, bringing out something slightly more in terms of the political theory of this debate tonight. There seems to be a little bit of disagreement about what the point of art is. Is art about the intent of the artwork, as I think we're suggesting on the opposition tonight? Is it about what uh, the artist intended to do with their work? Or is it about the truth and the beauty, as Letty so eloquently said in her speech, and that is what we are meant uh, to receive when we view pieces of art? And I would just say a couple of words very briefly in favor of the former. Um, Quentin Skinner, and if any of you are interested in a little bit of controversy behind the scenes between some very gifted intellectual people, I recommend you Google Bernard Williams, Quentin Skinner, marriage. Um, Quentin Skinner had some interesting thoughts, I think, on precisely this, and it is that anything, when someone is trying to communicate meaning, is doing something. Uh, they're not just merely putting words out there, they're trying to communicate an action or they're trying to do something with a degree of intent. It matters entirely who someone is and what they were trying to achieve and what the meaning of what they were trying to do is. Thomas Hobbes, who I love, um, would not be the same man if he wasn't trying to bring an end to the English Civil War and trying to demonstrate why peace was so worthwhile and why civil war was so damaging. And I would argue that it is deeply inherent in what we understand by art and what we understand in works of brilliance that we think about what they meant. And if we think about what they meant, we cannot stop thinking about who the people behind those works of art are. And therefore, I'd urge you to vote for the opposition tonight. Thank you. <laughs> And then moving to abstentions, I saw a very keen hand there at the back, so we'll go there. A uh, name and college for the record, please. <laughs> David Grace uh, Maudlin, spelt correctly. <laughs> um, when I saw this motion, I thought, like my neighbour Salvador, I don't care about this. But then, <laughs> listening to the debate, I thought, actually, I do care about it. I thought, I still want to see films with Kevin Spacey in, because I like his acting. I still want to see films made by Roman Polanski. And then I thought of a much more difficult example. Now, I hesitate to bring this example up because Keir Bradwell might have me banned from the society. <laughs> <laughs> there is a film of the Berlin Olympics, 1936, which is called Triumph of the Will. I think it's Lainey Riefenstahl who made it. And Clearly, uh, that, the, the purpose of that film was to demonstrate how wonderful the master race was, the, the Aryans. It, it has a completely immoral purpose. But as a piece of cinematography, it is superb. So I find if you make a moral judgment, you, don't want, you, you can't watch it. If you make an aesthetic judgment, you should watch it. And my problem is, I'm actually capable of making both moral and aesthetic judgments. So you see, in the end, I'm actually forced to abstain. Thank you. Thank you, David. We're making quite good time, and there's some really fascinating points of view in the chamber, so I'd like to go to another round of floor speech, if that's okay. Um, so back to proposition. Um, Owen Cooper, Selwyn College. It is easy enough for people to say bad artists should be punished for, by boycotting their bad art, by linking the art to the artist. But I'm afraid to say that those who cannot separate the art from the artist, when it is required, of course, this is can separate, not would, not must, but can. And therefore, we must sometimes separate the art from the artist when it's required. I would like to briefly take two examples. The first one, Caravaggio. 
quite a simple case from an Italian painter, Acts in Rome, lovely paintings, he also killed a man in a brawl. Now, I can still appreciate his art. I don't necessarily have to separate his art from himself. However, some might have to in order to be able to make moral choices. Now, the second one, much, much, much more extreme, and this one, I have to separate the art from the artist. Eric Gill, 1882 to 1940. He designed a lot of different things. A sculptor, an uh, English sculptor described by the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography as the greatest artist craftsman of the 20th century. Some of you may have heard of his Prosper and Ariel sculpture adorning the front of BBC Broadcasting House, recently attacked by a man with a hammer. He also carved the infamous, or should I say famous, uh, crocodile into the modern laboratory wall at the, uh, in the University of Cambridge. If any of you are members of the um, Cambridge University Physics Society, you'll recognize the logo. He also invented the Gil Sands font type, I believe, used in Penguin books. But this man, this man wrote personal diaries, which revealed um, over 40 years after his death, that he had sexually abused two of his daughters, had incestuous relationships with his sister, and had committed awful acts upon his dog. G Eric Gill was a monster, but his works are still culturally important. In this particular case, I think that we have to separate the art from the artist, because Eric Gill might be a monster, but he also had significant cultural impacts upon Britain. He designed war memorials, he designed fonts, he designed sculptures, and ultimately, if we can't separate the art from the artist when it's, in, when it's necessary, the choice is simple. We either have anarchy, anarchy if we cannot separate the art from the artist, where we have to destroy, burn every book, we have to smash every sculpture, or alternatively, we can sometimes, when necessary, separate the art from the artist. We can stand for anarchy, lack of culture, and destruction of tradition, or we can occasionally recognize a nuanced view, occasionally separate the art from the artist, and occasionally enjoy good art made by terrible, awful artists. So vote for proposition. Vote for proposition if you believe that we should sometimes separate the art from the artist, that we must sometimes separate the art from the artist when it is necessary, in such cases as Eric Gill. So thank you, and vote aye. <laughs> And then across to the opposition, is there a hand there? Yeah, in the third row. Yeah, so I'd like to make a speech um, on behalf of the opposition. So I want everyone to think about the sunflower by Van Gaal. Like imagine it's done by another artist or by someone, like someone else who's not Van Gaal. Do you still feel the power of it? I think like a, a painting like Sunflower, it's with the really bright color and like bright imagination, all the opt optimism and the kind of power you feel when seeing the, the painting, you don't realize it's done by someone who have been like Van Gogh, some artist throughout most of his life, been trapped in poverty, committed, uh, attempted to commit suicide s several times, and uh, have struggled with severe m mental health issues. So I think it's really important that we, when we view it through the lens of who are the artists who did who did the painting, that we actually get to see the paintings themselves through a different lens. So let's think about like Renaissance painting, like the, the, the Da Vinci paintings and Michelangelo's um, sculptures. They cannot be extracted from the historical context. They cannot be extracted from the Renaissance period of trying to de defy like the uh, re re religious painting of the pre previous age. And we think about like Picasso, Guernica, like about we cannot extract it from the historical context of the cruelty of, of the Second World War, and we cannot when we think about um, surrealism from Dali, we can't extract it um, from like the kind of the revolution they're trying to bring about, like the artists. Like I think it's impossible when we're trying to if we're trying to separate the art from the artists, we're ignoring a big part of the historical context about the life experiences of the artists, and we are. Real, not really not seeing the passions and the kind of life, life experiences the artists are trying to convey if we detach the arts from the artists themselves. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, to abstention. Uh, Michael Watts, uh, Queens. Um, I think if there's one thing that this debate has shown, and there's one thing that I think we could all agree that we can take from this, is that there is no definition of art. Everything that we can consider art is, is you know, we all have different opinions on it. I'll, I'll give you an example. Some of you in here, yes? 
No, no, there, there isn't, because everything, everything, it's, it's all dependent on personal opinion, that is art. I'll give, I'll give you an example. Many of you in here will think that Tracy Emin is an artist and that my bed is a piece of art. I'd say that's a load of bollocks. Um, I personally believe, uh, and this is going to be very low cultural, so I do apologise, I believe that uh, Jim Steinman is an artist and that Bat Out of Hell is the greatest masterpiece on earth. You, many of you in here, will say that I'm talking out of my arse. So we, we, to say that to se can separate the art from the artist is, is impossible because it all depends on personal opinion, personal taste, and on what that art is and who has, who has made it. So I urge you to abstain today because every single one of you in here will have a different opinion on what art is. Every one of you in here will have an opinion on what is art and what constitutes art. And every one of you will in here will have a completely different opinion on what you think good and bad art is. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm um, closing both for the opposition and for all the debates this year as a whole, so no pressure. I'd like to welcome Professor Derek Matravers. <laughs> Give you some introduction. Derek is a professor of the Open University and a fellow of Churchill College. Um, he is also the editor of the British Journal of Aesthetics. He's written on aesthetics and the philosophy of art, as well as more broadly on ethics and the philosophy of mind. Thank Derek, you. you have the floor. Um, Madam President, ladies and gentlemen, thank you um, very much for inviting me. It's very nice to be here. Um, I'm a very irenic person, and so I'm very pleased to be able to say that I agree with almost everything that um, my uh, opposition colleagues have said, because we clearly just don't understand the proposition being put in the same way. So, for example, when uh, the, the ex-president said that when we look at a Picasso, we don't need to go to Picasso in order to understand the painting. I mean, that's exactly the point, because when you're looking at a Picasso, you're engaging with Picasso. If you look at a work of art, what you're doing is you're engaging with the mind who produced the work of art. That's what, look, that's what engaging with a work of art is. So, of course, you don't need to find, go around and find other things about, works, about the people who produce the works of art in order to understand the work of art. That's what it means not to separate the art and the artist. And when um, Professor Eagleton says that uh, we, when we look at, at T. S., when we read T.S. Eliot's poetry, we don't necessarily listen to what T.S. Eliot said about his own poetry. We're better judges of his poetry than T.S. Eliot is. Of course we are, because T.S. Eliot is embodied in the poetry. That's just the point of not separating art from the artist. If you want to know the true T.S. Eliot, don't go to his letters, go to the poetry. If you want to understand James Joyce, Bloomsday, um, look at the work, because it's in the work that you will find James Joyce. That's just what the proposition, not to separate the art from the artist, means. So I want to co-opt all their arguments in favor of rejecting the proposition. Thank you. Um, that's not the end. <laughs> I'm notorious for short speeches, but they're even too short. Yes. Movies are difficult, because movies, um, movies don't tend to be produced by a single mind. So it depends on what your view of movies as an art is. So if you have a kind of a telly view, you might think that it's, there's a single controlling mind there, in which case you would be getting Harvey, Harvey Weinstein's um, mental states embodied in the work, if that's your view of cinema. I think it's a terrible view of cinema. So I think, I think cinemas are quite difficult to interpret as, as kind of art objects for that reason. They take a lot of work. Um, but I think that, you know, you don't just look at the thing and think, this fell from the sky, there's no intentions built in here. You've got to try and track the patterns, got to kind of work out what people have put, you know, why people have put in what they've put in. And that's what it is to engage with art. It's engage with art is finding patterns that make sense of the thing. Okay. Next point. Um, here's, here's, here's a thought. Okay, you might think that, here's, I'll, give you, I'll give the opposition an argument. Um, let's agree that everything you need to understand a work of art, you ought to be able to get from your experience of it. Okay, let's agree that. So then you might think, well, okay, if the critically relevant property, if the properties that are critically relevant are not available in the experience, then they're irrelevant. They're not critically relevant because if everything that you need is available in the experience, everything must be in the experience. Therefore, you don't need any knowledge of intentions. 
because you've just got the experience itself. You don't need any background knowledge at all. But, I mean, apart from the fact that engaging with the art just is engaging with the intentions I've shown, that's just such a weird view. I mean, imagine trying to read Paradise Lost while deliberately neglecting the knowledge that Milton was Cromwell's Latin secretary in the Civil War. So you've got this massive poem about a civil war in heaven, written by a man who's just lived through a civil war, and you want to deliberately ignore the fact that he lived through a civil war. I mean, why would you do that? Okay. Or Gauguin's paintings. I mean, why would you not want to know about Gauguin in order to interpret Gauguin's paintings? Now, we've come across a lot, a lot this evening about um, the connection between the proposition or the op 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 opponents of the proposition and, and this kind of the cancel culture idea. So you might think, okay, here's a danger with linking art and the artist. If you link the art and the artist and you have a bad artist, then surely that's a good reason for rejecting the art, not hanging the art, ignoring it, putting it to one side, sticking it, destroying it, or putting it in a basement somewhere. But that couldn't be more wrong. I mean, take, let's go back to Gauguin again. What is art? As I said, art is a place where all these intentions come to the fore, where people work out stuff, the most deeply problematic issues in the human condition. So you've got Gauguin's pictures. There's a man who spent his life trying to struggle to get out of the dead end that Impressionism got into. So he works for 20 years to try and get out of Impressionism, try and find something else to do. He's got problematic relationships with young girls in Tahiti. He's got the clash between the French civilization and the Tahitian civilization. He's putting this all into his art in a kind of way that he just works for years and years and years, putting it into his art. That's a good thing about looking at the art. You don't want to cancel the art because Gauguin's a bad person. And the same goes for Caravaggio and Eric Gill, et cetera, et cetera. The fact that these people are morally problematic people is a very good reason for keeping the art about to look at it, because this is the stuff, this is the place where all those issues are kind of worked out. So there really isn't a connection between, except between wanting to link the art and the artist and cancel culture. It's exactly the other way around. Um, yes. I'll take, take you first. Um, is that not notion then complicated by the fact that engaging with the art directly, monetarily may benefit the artist with, say, living artists? It may, yeah, I agree. There, I think there is, there is a, there, there, yeah, I think I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, I don't think, I mean, I don't think we should, I think we should look at, the, I think with certain, with certain cases of art, it makes sense to engage with the art, but in a way that we try not to honor the artist. So I think there are things that can be said there, but I think the thought that bad person, therefore the art's not worth looking at, is just an incoherent entailment. Yes, there was a, another point of order over there. No, right. Thank you. Uh, yes, I, yes and no. Yes, in as much as you agree with me. No, in as much as you don't. And uh, let, me, let me kind of spell that out, spell out what I mean. So um, certainly it's impossible to understand um, Levy Riefenstahl's films without some notion of the context. But we then might get onto a point that Professor Eagleton made, which is maybe we only need the context. Okay? Maybe if you look at the social and economic productions of those works of art, you can understand the content in a rich way, and you don't need to go through the psychology of the individual artist. But I don't think that's going to work, because the trouble is social and political contexts are just too big, right? And social and political contexts could encompass everything. So let's say, I don't know when clocks were invented, but let's just say that clocks were invented in Turin, right, in 1420. It's going to be part of the social and political context of any work of art produced in 1420 that clocks were invented in Turin. But it's going to be completely irrelevant unless the person producing the art knew about the clocks being invented in Turin. So social and political context is important in understanding these works of art. But you've got to kind of narrow it down to the social and political context that's relevant to the meaning of the art. And the only way you can narrow it down is by appeal to what the artist could have known, by appeal to... It has to be channeled through the psychology of the artist, otherwise it's just going to be irrelevant. So once again, 
you've got the connection between art and the artist. You're not going to give me a minute yet? God, this seems like it's going on for hours. I'm sorry about this. <laughs> um, okay. Um, I, think that's, I think that's about everything I have to say. But um, uh, I, I guess what I, I guess the point, I, I guess, I think there's, the, the, it's a misunderstanding of art to think that we can separate art from the artist. Um, simply because engages, sorry, I'm just, I'm just saying the same thing again now. Um, I'll keep saying it again until he gives a minute. The, um, <laughs> because engaging with a work of art just is engaging with, thank God for that, with the intentions um, of the artist. And so I think there's, there's nothing to fear. I don't think that, I think because of the, 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 the cancel culture point does, doesn't go through, and that seems to be the thing that's been bothering people most this evening, because that doesn't go through, there's nothing to fear from linking art with the artist. And I think there's everything to gain. Because if you uh, don't link the art to the artist, I don't think what, are you, you, what you're doing when you look at a picture is just not engaging with art. So I urge you to reject the motion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Derek, for a wonderful speech. And thank you to all our paper speakers and to everyone who's spoken in this debate tonight for a really fascinating and thought-provoking end of the term. I will let you all get out into the cool night air very soon. I want to say two things quickly. Um, the first is thank you to everyone for the last year who's come to our debate, who's got involved, who's engaged with society in good faith. It really means a lot. I know that a lot of you in here, this is your last debate as a student, third year's leaving. You're members for life. Please come back. It's a great place. Um, my second thing is um, I want to thank you all for allowing me to chair this debate and lead the society next term. If there's anything that we're getting wrong at the moment that you want us to change, find me in the bar after any debate, or most of the time, to be honest, or email me, because I really want to improve this place. If you want to celebrate the term, it's been a wonderful term. We have a garden party on the 18th, and tickets are still available at only £40. But on that note, um, I'll move to a vote. In this house, we vote with our feet. If you are convinced of the proposition, walk through the eye door. Opposition, walk through the nose, and right through the front if you want to abstain. Um, thank you all so much for coming. It's been wonderful.